having some kind of broad understanding regarding the basic pragmatics of life is important as a matter of implementation of any societal systemization whatsoever. This particular section ought be understood as a guide and suggestion regarding the pragmatic application of a moneyless free labor society. If, that is, people want to implement the system, understanding their basic familial obligations and the basic familial expectations within said system are fairly important. To be a bit blunt about it, if people simply start living in the relevant and appropriate manners, structuring their familial forms within the relevant and appropriate constraints implied by the moneyless free labor society, such actually has the pragmatic effect of if not outright actualizing the system as such, at least providing the proper conditions within which the system can be actualized. Much as is noted regarding other kinds of social business relations, ultimately these are accomplished via boring head nodding of agreement, wherein such entails a significant degree of reasonableness, kindness, and a cooperative spirit on the relevant matter. Such, in other words, is super simple. This section may touch upon some fairly, uh, touchy issues. I want to try and head off a fair number of them by noting that within the relevant feminist lit, there can be derived a somewhat simplistic but valid notion the various kinds of labor ought be available to both sexes and all genders. Reaching towards political enforcement is not generally desirable. Rather, as a generalizable cultural norm in which people simply choose to live that way is by far the better option. While this is more easily accomplished within places where feminism has taken root, even in places where it hasn't, avoiding the messiness of the political aspects is a very valid solution. Just live that way. Such pretty much works just as well in most cases, that is in most bioregions, for the LGBTQAI plus folks. Note that in the moneyless free labor society, overarching laws governing people's behavior on a political level are largely moot. Worth noting too that divine laws within all faiths are changing towards the acceptance of the LGBTQAI plus folks, and I strongly suspect that within this system that kind of renewal of the faiths will only grow. In terms of making, having, and raising babies, broadly speaking the aim ought to be having one to three babies per woman. Noting that that kind of metric, per woman, is just denoting a good way to count, and isn't really intended as any kind of onus on women. The notion therein is that if people want to continue the species, we generally have to continue making, having, and raising babies. This isn't some horror, despite some of the rhetoric that is out there. Making babies is literally fun. Gestation of babies is labor, but not entirely unpleasant or exceptionally hard labor, at least not for most women. Giving birth to them for many and perhaps most women is a joyful, interesting, and intense sort of experience, something that ought perhaps be viewed a bit more as a privilege of being a woman, as it is an experience men don't really get to have. It's sadly worth noting that the actual mortality rates from birth are extremely minimal. The sadness there being all the claims about it being otherwise. Such claims are derivatives of the abortion debates, not really rooted in anything like facts, that is, the silly debates over if a woman is more or less likely to die or suffer harm from abortion or giving birth. It really is a difference of far less than 1% in all cases either way. That is, differences that are small fractions of a percentage point. In other words, it's quibbling over bullshit for political reasons that have to do with opinions about abortions, not about the actual safety of women. 
The moneyless free labor society provides very well for people. In terms of addressing many of the more conservative folks' concerns regarding family values, divorce rates, birthing rates, etc., a fair amount of these issues stem exactly from people being overworked, concerns about housing, money, making ends meet, etc. The Moneyless Free Labor Society satisfies those kinds of concerns. Lacking any particular monetary incentives for divorce, marriage becomes more stable. Whereas the labor incentives which are extremely valid concerns for parents favor staying together, which again is in the best interests of children. Laws and norms that provide for the general 50-50 custody in the cases of divorce likewise greatly diminishes any incentives to divorce. If no one is expected to either be graced or burdened with primary custody, there isn't any real incentive on that point to divorce. On that point I'd note that folks making claims of being burdened by having primary access to their babies are severely missing the horrors associated with being cut off from such access. Similarly, for folks interested in non-coupling relationships, which for what it's worth are very traditional to anyone who is a student of history, the Moneyless Free Labor Society likewise provides for those capacities. The questions of if, when, and how to mate, make love, make a home together, etc., are largely left up to the individuals involved to be blunt about it. There isn't any particular favoritism involved, save this. The system is deliberately designed to discourage single parents. The main rationale for that has little or nothing to do with the adults and everything to do with the children. By far and away it is in the best interests of children to have at least two parents. At the same time, the overall work hours in the system in the first pass through are not more than they currently are, and likely are very less, while the stresses associated with monies and such are essentially alleviated entirely. That is, yes the single parent has to work more, but then they also don't really have a lot of stress. I'd add that there are so many publicly available systems to in effect raise your kid for you, in other words public schools, convenience foods, fast foods, etc that the overall workload compared to the olden times is far, far less. As a matter of labor, without blaming women on the point, women entering the workforce en masse has a rather obvious effect of creating extra labor. Some of this is desirable, some of it is not, but the issue of creating surplus labor in the system is a problem. Understanding that ethically speaking and pragmatically speaking, there is no meaningful difference between if the woman or the man does the labor primarily within or without of the home, the issue tends to arise when both attempt to do only the labor outside of the home, or potentially if both try to do only the labor within the home. In pretty boring pragmatics, one or the other ought to do the labor without of the home and within the home, or they ought to roughly evenly split the labor within and without of the home 50-50. Details may vary, but as a pretty serious matter of pragmatics regarding the creation of surplus labor, folks generally ought follow that kind of paradigm. Noting that childless couples are not really in the same kind of position, specifically, the labor within the home is pretty light without the labor of taking care of children. Childlessness could be a choice of the couple, or it could be a matter of after the children have grown either way, the relevant dynamic changes at that point. In boring old pragmatics of relationships, it ought not be that difficult to see how absent any children, wherein the in-home labors in the current have already been so greatly lightened, that those working without of the home may grow cankerously grumpy over the disparity between the labors being done. 
This point is particularly idiosyncratic to individual familial units. For instance, there may be elderly that are being taken care of, or the sick, etc. But the main point is that folks ought to be cognizant and respectful of their lovers, partners, and familial forms, rather than treating them as if they were tools to be used towards their own ends, or as something to be bitterly fought over. A spirit of generosity, helpfulness, love, kindness, etc., goes a long ways, and hopefully the reduction in out-of-the-home workloads and relative ease of access to the needs, wants and desires of peoples more generally can enable folks to, well, not be such asshats to each other. See also Section 14J, Types of Labor, Labor Resentment and Related Discussions. Pragmatic Concerns of Life In terms of how to live, what to do, the moneyless free labor society is largely indifferent. As it relates to politics, however, there is something of worth to be said therein. Given the very minimized role of politics within the system, one ought expect there to be few laws beyond those that criminalize harmful actions towards each other. More or less in line with the Western traditions, the notion therein is roughly that folks are free to do what they want, provided they aren't actively harming someone else. As noted earlier, many of the laws are likely to go away, as much of the law deals with the issues surrounding money. Note that that notion of ethics is not without its issues. Though it may be the case that such is the relevant legal notion rather than the relevant ethical notion. These aspects are given a great deal of discussion and examination in the odd questions of privilege, a slight history of colonialism. Readers ought refer to that piece for questions and concerns regarding ethics and legalities and the pragmatics of living. Likewise, as such are applicable to gendered concerns specifically, readers ought refer to the rape of the swan and the sweetness of trans. The remaining laws that deal with the pragmatics of mating and children, such as divorces, abuse, family homes, etc. I don't really expect there to be many major changes therein, save of course as they may relate to money, in which case in the moneyless free labor society such is not really a concern. At bottom, regarding divorces, I'd expect that all other things being equal, the couple decides who gets the home. We may prefer to weigh in favor of the primary caregiver, noting that such is far more about maintaining a stable familiar environment for the children and has little to do with the adults. In cases wherein there is no primary caregiver, that is, wherein the coupling have decided to more or less evenly divide the labor requirements outside the home, honestly my intuition is that the couple is far more likely to make good determinations on that themselves, since it isn't a fight about money, the horrors of child support, spousal support, etc., Wherein they cannot do so, such likely is just best left up to dispute resolution centers, and various means of equitable distribution via third parties, etc., the law as such ought generally not be involved, save in instances of relevant abuse. In other words, absent any criminal activity on the part of one or both of the parents, the law as such ought not be utilized as a method of determination in divorces. Agreeing to utilize dispute resolution centers already entails adhering to their determinations. Again though, my strong suspicion is that the divorce rates will rather dramatically drop within the moneyless free labor society, and as the principal issues with divorce surrounding money and wealth are gone, much of the hardships associated with divorce resolution will go away. Some of these issues are given a fuller treatment in the rape of the swan. Extended Family 
What we ought expect within a moneyless free labor society is something of a return towards living with slash near extended family. Larger family homes, built over time, wherein multi-generational families live together are likely to become more common. The reason being that the various incentives to move for jobs, find one's own home, etc., are largely diminished. Such isn't a rule, just a forecast regarding likely outcomes to consider as regards some of the pragmatics of life. A fair amount of that rationale stems from the removal of surplus labor in the market, specifically as regards care for the elderly. Taking care of the elderly is an important matter, and it is generally best done within the family. Such won't always be possible, of course. Sometimes the care required is too great. Sometimes the family simply isn't really capable of doing so for this or that reason, but in general with people granted back their surplus labor, such is very likely to become far more common. Labor, after all, abhors surplus labor. Beyond the hands of labor, there is a likelihood that families in general love and care for each other and hence are likely to actually take care of each other if given the time, resources, and such to do so. It is worth noting, but not really dwelling on too deeply here, that in general people are living longer healthier lives, and we might expect that parents will want to go live their lives separate from their kids, at least while they are healthy enough to do so. They may not, again, not really a rule, just a forecast of likely outcomes. Transference of Homes Absent any reason in particular to sell a home, we might expect folks to simply pass their homes down intergenerationally. Such would be a norm, with families working out the details. However, such does raise a very brief conundrum, how does one move? if one is so inclined to do so? Find someone else who wants to move to your home, of course. Trade houses. Such may involve something like a deed, it may not, depending on how lax folks really want to make it. Other options may be finding a vacant home elsewhere and moving there. No fuss, no muss. We may worry that this could lead to people pressuring each other to move, trade houses, etc. But on this I am inclined to largely go with the notion that people are better at making up their own minds on the matter than having some law trying to determine it for them. Granting that taking advantage of people with mental disabilities would be a criminal sort of action, that is, bilking someone out of their home. I'd suggest too though that with an increase in the presence of other family members, this is not as likely to happen. In other words, the old person living alone kind of thing is less likely to happen, and wherein they are living alone, they are more likely to have close ties with other family members. I'd also point out the incentives to do so are mostly pretty small in the moneyless free labor society people already have homes, they aren't making any money off the process, just potentially living somewhere they'd prefer, or in a house they'd prefer. Still, it is a place wherein criminal activity may occur, so likely someplace wherein local legal and hence governmental regulation, resolution and enforcement measures are warranted. Such would occur within the relevant limits of bioregional renewal rates, however. Trading homes doesn't generally have any meaningful impact on the bioregions, and in the case of vacant homes such may very well have a positive impact, as in, signaling that there is a surplus of homes in one location that is being reduced by taking on the vacant home. Regardless, the people vacating one home are effectively creating one vacant home and nullifying another vacant home. Hence, in the grand scheme of things, there is no net change in the system. Such may nonetheless manage to run into issues regarding a bioregion's renewal rates, 
but such is best handled within that local bioregion, as they're the ones primarily tasked with managing that sort of thing on the ground, though see also Big Computer as a meaningful tool for such determinations. It will likely grow more common for long-standing familial relations with a given home, as in, this home has been passed down for generations in my family. Such ought be considered a meaningful claim to the home in the instances of divorce. Therein the interests of the children and broader familial form are preferenced over the concerns of the primary caregiver. Such begs the question as to what constitutes a familial home, though such is pretty likely answerable rather simply, has the home been passed down between at least two generations or not? Note that who moves to which home remains something determined by the couple. I tend to hold the view that in instances of the death of the spouse, the home would generally transfer to the surviving spouse, unless other arrangements have been made, such as generally speaking likely passing the home to shared children. There is the plausibility that it is in the best interest of the children to remain in the familial home with their primary caregiver, without the rights of transference of intergenerational home status being transferred as such. In other words, the primary caregiver retains rights to the familial home in virtue of them being the primary caregiver, but the intergenerational status as such remains with the other spouse. In technical concerns, the home is already intergenerationally related to both spouses via the children. In the primal sense of children, in other words, neither spouse really has a stake in the matter beyond their immediate lifetime. The question herein is to which branch of the family does the home remain as primarily intergenerational to? On that particular note I'd again stress that much of this is of less concern within the moneyless free labor society, but it is of some concern. I'd also strongly suggest that the strict delineation of the familial forms is somewhat dubious. In other words, the familial relationships as such ought to remain regardless of divorce. The tendency to do otherwise is something of an ethical foul. In instances of abuse, critically understanding that such occurs regardless of the sex of the persons involved, there ought be considered a right of determination on the matter of the home in favor of the spouse that is the sufferer of the abuse. Such is a somewhat delicate matter, as false accusations of abuse become a thing within such a framework. Perhaps more to the point, such presents people with the opportunity to mudsling in divorce, to exaggerate harms, to attempt to find fault, wherein perhaps there was little or none. It incentivizes bad behavior. To be as clear as I can on the point, in instances wherein there are incentives to claim abuse, to claim that harm has been done, such actually factually incentivizes folks to make false accusations, to exaggerate harms done, and in general, to fight over things within that framework. In case that still isn't clear to folks, to put it in terms of money, an entirely illusory kind of thing, to firstly create the illusion of money, and then to pretend that money is real, is to create the moneyed arena wherein folks fight, to incentivize fighting about money, and to cause folks to fight for the sake of money. Similarly to create the, admittedly not merely illusory concern of abuse as the battleground, whereby indeed the illusory concerns of money are to be had, and the ephemeral concerns of social grace to be won, and the more concrete aspects of familial love, material goods of the home are to be had, is to also create fairly far-flungly perverse incentives to determine things as if there were in factuality a winner and a loser, an abused and an abuser. Moreover, it is to create the perverse incentives to act as if there were abuse at all, 
to magnify abuse to play the victim, all of which has horrible consequences of not only dramatic false accusations, the tearing of families apart, but also the covering over of those who actually do suffer in instances of actual abuse. Cause again, it isn't that abuse itself is mere illusory concerns, it is that there are so many other perverse incentives involved that folks turn the everyday into drama, turn the norm into trauma, and act as if, merely to gain the social graces that come with being a victim, and the material goods that come from faking it. I have honestly tended towards a disposition that abuse happens in relationships, and it is almost always a two-way, or multi-way thing. Not always, but generally it is. In other words, sometimes relationships get ill, and people within them tend to misbehave in terrible ways towards each other. My heart on the matter is that such is unfortunate, yet ought generally not be an issue of major consideration in most cases of divorce. Such in other words is something like the expected outcomes of some relationships, though I certainly wouldn't suggest that such become an expected norm of behavior. We may even go so far as to suggest that if the couple is getting divorced, chances are that abuse of some kind, or at any rate disputes, arguments, fighting and so forth are underpinning the divorce, rather than some kind of bland practically cause-free no-fault happening. Hence, the heavily weighting of the issues of abuse in the matter of divorce is pragmatically dubious. In cases of divorce, the couple is already likely at odds with each other. Chances are good one or both of them have actually behaved poorly towards each other, and hence the incentives to mudsling can be great. My suggestion is that absent many of the causes of the issues of abuse, the actuality of abuse will diminish. Wherein issues of money are concerned, as is frequently the case, the moneyless free labor society addresses those kinds of underpinning causes. Such also touches rather bluntly on the wisdoms associated with polyamory regarding how to overcome many of the emotional hurdles associated with intimate lovers' relationships in general, as well as a fair number of wisdoms associated with the feminisms more broadly. Though I have to note that those particular wisdoms are almost always one-sided from the feminine perspective, they rarely address the issues associated with the feminine aspects of abuse and behavior in general in an intimate loving relationship, and broadly tend to discount or outright dismiss and attempt to argue against the concerns associated with the masculine perspectives. Such isn't to dismiss the feminine and feminist wisdoms, but to note that the issues involved with abusive behavior in intimate relationships is not exhausted by the feminist critiques of it. So, what does that mean in the case of divorce? Pragmatically it means that the various relevant issues regarding abuse are underdetermined and currently heavily skewed towards the concerns of women in general. And hence in the current are dubious grounds for serious consideration on the matter of divorce as it relates to who stays in the home. That said, the issue of abuse is a real thing, and wherein it is not like a shit show between two people, that is, wherein one spouse is clearly an abuser, such ought be seriously considered as a rationale in the abused's favor for rights of determination, as to if they want to live in the familial home or not. As in the case of spousal death, however, I don't think such confers a right of transference of the home to the abused's family as such. It just confers the right for the abused to make the determination regarding if they want to continue living in the home, have effective control of the house, or would prefer to move out. Relevantly noting again that via the children such rights of transference have already occurred, both spouses' children literally have rights to the home in question. 
On that note it is likely worth saying that therefore the children have the right of expectation to live within that home, and have determination of how the home is passed on. In other words, in cases wherein the spouse to whom the home is not within the intergenerational line is nonetheless granted the rights to remain within the home, they are not conferred the rights to remove the home from the original familial line. Such may seem to some to infringe on the rights of the individual to determine where they live. However, it is worth noting that such is already the case within the currents. A parent that chooses to move from the general familial home bioregion tends to lose custody rights as such. The preference here is not towards the adults, but of course towards the children's interests. Such entails that if the spouse in question so chooses, they are entitled to live within the home at least until the children are of age, whenever the society in question determines that they are adults. In most societies in the current this is basically around age 18, though there is clearly some variance in the matter. The spouse may so choose to remain longer, such is not particularly a legal matter at that point, but rather a familial matter. In other words, at that point the matter is far more about familial relationships that don't particularly belong within some legal standard. As the legal standard in these kinds of cases is far more concerned with protecting the interests of the children until they become of age. Noting relevantly though that the default is that right of determination as to the status of the house resides primarily with the offspring. Likewise noting that it isn't as if the parent is necessarily thrown out on the street after all homes are free and moreover, the tendency is exactly towards intergenerational homes within the moneyless free labor society. In all likelihood the relevant parents may indeed prefer the option of moving to some different location. If after all the principal concern of the individual in question is the rights to determine their own life, such ought not strike them as a matter of great concern anyway. Moreover. In the current the prospects of travel and communication between peoples entails a fairly radical difference from all earlier times. It isn't, in other words, as if to move actually entails being disconnected from family, friends, etc., and the prospects of long-term moving back are very realistic. Worth noting that in instances wherein children are not involved, the situation is simpler and likely amounts to wills and very likely standard practices in the current on the matter, as they relate to law that is. Suppose it is worth noting since we are on the topic that the 50-50 split of custody as a norm is the right kind of distribution, exceptions relating mostly to location, as alluded to earlier. Noting, however, that the parent that chooses to dramatically change locations is the parent that forfeits their right to a 50% stake in the parental relationship. In such instances it remains in the best interests of the children to maintain some kind of relationship with the forfeiting parent, such is largely already covered within existing law, such as weekend parents or every other weekend parents, etc. With the ethical norm being the parents remaining cordial and familial gathering being inclusive to all parents. In cases wherein we are handling multiple lovers, the situation will likely be more difficult but follow the same metrics. Primary consideration being given to intergenerational homes, Secondary consideration given to the primary caregiver. Tertiary considerations being given to peoples that don't fit within either of the previous categories. In terms of lineage, I am inclined to say that the biological parents have primacy of concerns, though non-biological parents' concerns matter too. I'd suggest that the existing laws regarding this within America 
perhaps the Western world, and perhaps indeed most, developed countries largely cover the relevant concerns as they relate to the care of children, step-parents, etc., and that such essentially is transferable to multi-lover relationships. That is, the likely role of a non-biological parent in a multi-lover relationship is analogous to a step-parent, albeit perhaps with potentially greater standing in that they may have been step-parents from the get-go, unlike step-parents in most instances. Still, I suspect the laws as written are oft going to be sufficient in that they are capable of covering exactly the instances of step-parents who were such from the infancy of the child. The adaptation to one whereby a multi-lover relationship occurs from the get-go, with parental concerns intending to be equally divided may not be particularly difficult. Though I would suggest that the interests of children ought not be split between more than two homes. It is already a difficulty for children to be ferried between two homes, to have their lives split between two houses, and so forth. In the event of a division occurring whereby a third or fourth step-parent has a home, the children ought not have their lives further divided between these differing homes. Such is a delicate matter and may require some degree of nuance to it, as in, if a parental figure is abusive to the children, such may entail a good cause for them to not continue to be involved with the children. Absent any extenuating circumstances, preference would remain with the biological parents. In instances where the step-parent divorces the biological parents, providing that the step-parent has a meaningful relationship with the children, the step-parent ought continue to have parental rights to the children up to on a par with being a biological parent, though not defaulting to being on a PAR. Such is highly circumstantial, with an eye towards what is best for the children. The notion is that if a step-parent has had a long-term meaningful parental relationship with the child, it is generally in the child's best interest to maintain that relationship. The only meaningful issues that remain regard the familial home, though the preceding criteria regarding couplings can be utilized, there simply being two or more people involved that are not of the familial line to which the home belongs, and there being some plausible complexity involved in determination of a primary caregiver. Tertiary relationships deserve more consideration than they are generally afforded in the laws as they are, but the suspicion is that current laws regarding familial concerns are likely adaptable to multi-lover relationships. That said, within the moneyless free labor society, there isn't nearly as many issues associated with family law as there are within a moneyed society. Many of the issues become fairly ephemeral, associated with the well-being of any children involved regardless of biological lineage, and become wrapped up in notions of community and love more broadly understood. Much of the moneyed concerns are dissolved, with the remaining material concerns being of a far less contentious and cankerous nature, as they don't involve lifelong hardships, life and death considerations, or harms that may come with being forced into situations people don't want to be by dint of divorce. Getting another home, another place to live, isn't such a hardship. There is literally no such thing as being financially responsible for someone else, well, at least not directly so, there being material and community responsibilities in general. There would or could very well be concerns such as who becomes primary caregiver, how workloads are divided post-divorce, but those kinds of concerns are not nearly as contentious, life-threatening, or of life-altering status. There would remain concerns about material goods as a matter of sentimentality, but those largely can be dealt with in pragmatic manners, 
such as taking turns picking items that are contested as to who ought to have them. None of this requires a great deal of thought, in other words, just a bit of basic understanding, kindness in divorce, and pragmatics of consideration. By faith-based action what this piece is referring to are the plausible tasks that faith-based organizations can take towards the implementation of the moneyless free labor society. As I am viewing this, there are in essence just a few broad things worth mentioning on the point. Speaking truth to power. Basic advocating towards the existing people in power. This entails speaking to those people in power, be they people in positions of political power, or those in positions of industrial power. From a faith-based perspective, beyond advocating on the details, merits, etc., of the moneyless free labor society, such can be advocated for along moral, ethical, and faith-based grounds. Appealing to these people via the concerns of faith, advocacy for the poor, peace advocacy, community advocacy, etc. Simply start practicing the system. Such can entail advocacy to folks within local businesses, industrial companies, and labor organizations. The relevant point is that once a critical mass of people within a given bioregion and likely its adjacent bioregions is reached, simply practicing those prayers, that is, doing the kinds of actions required, is technically sufficient for the actualization of the system. Many folks who currently own businesses, industry, and companies after all are practicing faithful of one faith or another act as organizing structures for people. Without taking political control or indeed trying for control as such, the various faith-based organizations can act as organizers, centralized hubs whereby these kinds of practices can be taught and brought to actualization. Understanding that the ask and the task is specifically not to attempt change in figurehead leadership, nor in leadership of any given industry or business. The task is in essence towards the development of relevant local agreements between various businesses, labor organizations, and industries to implement the system. The role of the faith-based organization in this regard is essentially to act as mediators, diplomats, neutral ground in a sense, while also acting as advocates for the moneyless free labor system. Spreading the word to the faithful. It's basic, something of a no-brainer, but it is important. This can mean such things as speaking to people within congregations, and it can mean speaking to people not within congregations. Going to community gatherings, door-to-door, -door, and so forth. I kinda assume this isn't really necessary to detail. Become action-based centers. This aspect is related to acting as organizational centers, but rather than focusing on being the neutral ground between other existing structures, the aim is to utilize the existing material and spiritual structures towards the direct implementation of moneyless free labor societies. If I have to explain what the spiritual structures are to you, this section may not be particularly applicable to you. Still, to not be overly dismissive of such questions, I am referring to the structures of faithful dependence upon one another, the various ritualistic actions that folks take that solidify themselves as a community the goodwill established through such practices towards the aims of some heretofore unknown modality of living for the species. The aims towards that indefinite future of dreamful dreamings and most musical musing muses. The leaps of faith. Of the material structures, I refer to the more tangible material manifestations of those spiritualized structures, 
likely best understood as the various interconnections that have been made via the internets, but also and rather drastically importantly, the buildings of the faiths. The various centers of gathering for the faithful, which are fairly well placed throughout the world, including in areas whereby action is more direly needed. The argument here is to utilize that infrastructure towards the stated aims here as volunteer centers. To center the good works missions of most faiths towards these specific aims, whereby the labor to accomplish the tasks is largely provided for via the faiths. The technical know-how to do so being something at least largely obtainable via the volunteer labor. The material goods required to do so being asked for by the faith institutions of the relevant business institutions. Noting again that there are significant overlaps there, as in, most folks who run businesses are also adherents of faith. The pragmatics thereof amounting to something akin to the following. Donate the materials, or at the very least, give them to us at cost, and we'll supply the labor on the ground presence, and technical know-how to build the relevant infrastructure in places that need it, towards the stated aims of moneyless free labor societies. The labor is used to train and work with the local populations, indeed, insofar as such is possible, the labor is derived from the local populace. The aim, after all, is to construct viable self-sustaining bioregionally bound structures, utilizing the best technologies available, structured rather specifically to supply the local bioregion primarily, adjacent bioregions secondarily, and only tertiarily non-adjacent bioregions. These kinds of endeavors are in all likelihood geared firstly towards the construction of cottage industries, and secondarily towards the broader labor economy, whereby the cottage industries are those industries that have the capacity to exactly supply the demands that the broader labor economy needs. The less worked materials being produced by the cottage industries which can then be refined via the labors of the broader local economy. The aim, again though, is rather explicitly to do so without recourse to money as the final output. This can functionally be accomplished by either doing so outright, as in, utilization of monies and donations towards the construction of the relevant cottage industries, whereby upon their completion they produce goods and services expressly with the aim of giving them away to other cottage industries, or the broader labor economy in the region, or they build the agreements with those they supply that once critical mass is reached, they will forego the symbologies of money in favor of the smile. Method the utilization of the former is really plausible if there is a critical mass already established. The establishing of that critical mass can be accomplished via exactly the faith-based structures being utilized. Which is to say that most people are in point of fact the faithful, hence, if the faith structures are organizing this, it follows that insofar as the faithful are indeed being faithful, then critical mass is actually had. I would strongly suggest that, hopefully with overstepping my boundaries in a positive way here, that such constitutes the functional pragmatic role of the faithful, the material and spiritual structures, within what the faithful would refer to as the divine plan. That is, the utilization of those structures as means of achieving critical mass towards the relevant divine aims. Here I am simply arguing and, ah, uh, presenting a strong suggestion that in the pragmatics of it all, the divine aims entail, if not this exact proposal, something very much akin to moneyless free labor societies. The utilization of the latter being relevant insofar as critical mass hasn't been reached, relative to any given bioregion. To reiterate the point that it might stick the landing better. 
If a given faith structure has enough pull to sway a sufficient number of a given region's people to enact a moneyless free labor system, then they utilize the former methodology, building the relevant cottage industries and adjacent labor economic entities from the ground up under the auspices of agreements, sealed with a smile. If not, then they utilize the latter methodology, entering into agreements with folks in a similar manner as is done already within moneyed societies, using money as a means of symbolic trade, but with a caveat to those agreements that when critical mass is reached, when, that is, a sufficient number of trade relations that have that style of agreement are reached, the utilization of the symbology of money will be end. In either case, building with an eye and an aim towards the bioregionally constrained modeling so as to properly lay the groundwork for the systemization as a whole, which, importantly, has as a boon to it the well-ordered structuring of the local labor and material economy within which they are working. Hence, that is, there will be more immediate as well as longer-term boons to the doing of such things. Thoughts on the Currents of the Faiths Perhaps the only section within this piece wherein such speak is appropriate. Some thoughts I've had from a somewhat queer historical perspective. What would our ancestors think of the various aspects of the world within which we all find ourselves? Here, I do not want to speak towards the rather horrific aspects they exist, but then, the notion of this piece is that they can be ameliorated at the least, perhaps eliminated in their entirety. Such depends of course on at least these three things. 1. The efficacy of the thesis. 2. The capacity of this piece to convey the proper meaning. 3. The willingness for folks to do what is not merely necessary, but also what they want and desire to do. The thoughts? I mean, consider the world faiths. What is currently within our capacity to do? Perpetual summer, continuous years of plenty. Does such entail the actual constant repetition of the season of summer? Nay. But the availability of the bountifulness of summer is plausibly available to everyone on the planet. To which faiths does that particular notion of heaven, of the good life, suggest? Play fighting, the utilization of toys to mockingly kill each other, sometimes roughly harm each other, and the medical capacity to heal each other of all but the most serious of wounds. Moreover, Tunes, the video games, wherein folks can pretend to war, pretend to kill, and pretend to be killed, over and over, to their little heart's content. To which faiths does such belong as a conceptualization of heaven, of the good life? The capacity to create with our own hands the various processes of life, to mold within our image the very biological structures of life, and so too, the various potential non-biological structures of life. To which faiths does such belong? Whom conceptualized such things? Whom considered such the good life? Our capabilities at creating technological wonders to fly in a literal sense with or without an airplane to aid us, to sail the seas, to dig into the deepest parts of the earth, to submerge within the waters of the earth. How many faiths dreamed of such things, I wonder? Liberation, freedoms of life, sexual, laborious, creative, interracial, intersexual, religious, actualizable, individualistic yet functionally communal, aspirational, the dreamers, the beautiful and the sublime thinkers, the dutiful doers and the dangerous lovers. Such faiths as these, to whom do they belong, I wonder, I surmise perhaps, but still too I wonder. That we may see the heavens our ancestors dreamed of, that we may understand their inner workings, 
that we may comprehend their mysteries, that indeed we may travel to what our ancestors would have well understood as the heavens, among which faiths was such thought of, aimed for, understood as a good life, that we may love, and that we may love the wisdoms we do have, but which we beg, borrow, ask for in all politeness, and indeed, steal when is necessary, those lovers' muses, and muses of lovers. How close we may be to whatever it is those faiths have proclaimed as heaven. Such I wonder, from time to time, depending so much on such ponderous things as. How seriously, and with what levities to really take any of this. Do we really want this species to continue to live? On a personal level, which may be relevant, I take so little of this seriously, but for my babies. The concern I have that their lives may be blessed, wonderful, beautiful, magical are deeply held within my heart, within my love, within my actions. I consider, after all, what kind of life they may live and such really is understood as being a predicable disposition as to the second question. Do I want my, and indeed, our beautiful babies to live? If I have such concern for their well-being, how could that not also entail a desire for the species as such to live? Among the most basic aspects of concern are the concerns of choices. Do laborers decide what labors they do? Or does someone other than they decide such things? What are the primary motivations of such choices? Are they decided by others, and if so, by whom? What are the principal concerns of peoples in general? I am struck by the degree whereby a lack of trust fundamentally determines the who of the decider. If I trust my neighbor to make reasonable, responsible decisions, I do not really have much concern regarding the choices they make. If there is some kind of overarching theory whereby such decisions are made which I trust, I do not particularly care about the decisions they make. I do care about what that overarching theory upon which such decisions are made is, but within that acceptable framework? In a meaningful sense I tend towards the preference of the individuals to make the relevant choices, rather than someone other than the individuals to make those kinds of choices. I assume, perhaps naively, perhaps foolishly, perhaps rather soberly, laden with wisdoms, that provided that the framework is sound, people will tend to make choices that are also sound, without me or anyone else making those choices for them. In some meaningful pragmatics, even boring pragmatics, regarding life, provided that people are given, even gifted, their basic needs, wants, and desires, I assume that they will tend towards making choices that are not harmful towards others. My general proposal here is that providing those kinds of conditions whereby people are enabled to make sound choices, in virtue of their having an abundance that meets their needs, wants, and desires, they will strongly tend towards making choices such that they continue to meet those needs, wants, and desires. Consider the relevant points in the current regarding moneyed economics, especially as it relates to capitalism, that is, something like a meritocracy, as alluded to in the beginning of this piece. The ethical underpinning of a meritocracy ostensibly is that the best, or at least the better, rise to the top. None of this is particularly novel, but it is worth saying and placing within the context of the moneyless free labor society's theoretical framework. Among the rather obvious and well-known concerns within the current are the issues associated with folks being advantaged or disadvantaged by dint of their birth. The requirement, in other words, for the ethicity of the system to hold is fundamentally that there be a level playing field 
for everyone and that there be no unjust discriminatory forces. A level playing field essentially boils down to not having any advantages or disadvantages relative to the other people in the system. This point is actually fairly tricky even in theory. The simplest theoretical framework, which I'll note is not really practical or even desirable, is to hold that everyone has the exact same resources available to them from the get-go. Same homes, vehicles, same parental figure types, etc. In practice, of course, there are many differences from person to person, experience to experience, degree of access to resources, etc. A somewhat less implausible understanding of a level playing field is a locally constrained version, as in, are there differences that unlevel the playing field between people living roughly within the same region? This is a bit more practical in that at least in terms of resource access. It's not that difficult to imagine that folks within a given region may have more or less the same starting point. Note though that much of the moneyless free labor societies attempts to provide relatively the same resources regardless of the bioregion, especially via the metrics of trade within the open gift-giving market. In any case, let's pretend for the moment the more implausible version. Supposing it were the case that we actually had a level playing field in the theoretical sense. The notion of no unjust discriminatory forces is likewise a fairly tricky proposition. The intent is to delineate between the meritorious, discriminating forces and those unmeritorious, discriminating forces. The rationale for why there has to be such a delineation within a meritocracy-styled systemization is that folks want to make the determination of merit on sound, valid, ethical grounds. Determining who or what organization provides better goods and services after all requires that there be some methodology that makes that determination predicated upon the actual merits of the relevant people and organizations involved. Rather blandly put, considerations of race, class, gender, or sexuality are not meaningful categories to use in the discriminatory process of a meritocracy. Hence, of course, the issues associated with racism, sexism, classism, bigotry, etc., and pretty much all the dialogue in the current regarding discrimination, oppression, and concerns about utilizing those kinds of categorizations to make such discriminations on merit at all, e.g. concerns regarding race quotas, affirmative action, and so forth, as well as concerns regarding outright discriminations predicated upon such things, and discriminations predicated upon legacy issues of such things. Clearly in practice there are a lot of issues with delineating between just and unjust discriminatory metrics in a meritocracy. Here I want to just in theory eliminate those kinds of distinctions as meaningful metrics and assume that we've dealt with them all. As with the implausible level playing field, there likely is a lot of implausibility in this assumption, but let's just pretend for the sake of understanding the more fundamental issues within a meritocracy systemization. It's worth noting that within the current, merit is essentially determined via money, what is meritorious is given more money. There are of course other metrics of merit even within the current, but in terms of the moneyed economic systemization, money is exactly the metric that is used. Money grants people wealth and the capacity to have greater access to the various goods and services available. So, assuming a level playing field and a just discriminatory practice of merit determination, a meritocracy has the following expected outcomes, some folks will do better than others. 
By doing so, some folks are effectively granted greater privileges than others. They are, in other words, rewarded with more money, and that money is utilizable to better access the various goods and services of the society. Moreover, we may hold that by granting that kind of reward, the better practitioners were incentivized to exactly do better. We may very well hold that all such is well and good it is, in other words, at least possible that such would be the case. The issue arises rather straightforwardly though, and again, it isn't really much of a secret. Even those who founded the systemization noted it. Wealth accumulation develops, and on iteration, understood as generations, the level playing field is lost, and folks become either advantaged or disadvantaged in the process. Hence, we can derive from this much of the argumentation and dialogue surrounding taxing the rich, the death tax debate, redistribution of wealth, as well as somewhat more obtuse concerns regarding the purposeful declining of this or that industry or practice, the importance of maintaining competition, and so forth. The astute may also note within that the argument that the Constitution, or more broadly put, the basic governing agreements, ought to be restructured regularly, in no small part to help deal with these kinds of inevitable disruptions to the system. The not overtly obtuse ought be able to understand much of the discourse surrounding systemic discrimination, legacy discrimination, and issue of outright racism, sexism in this light. But here I want to take the time to speak it clearly. Legacy discrimination are discriminations stemming from previous iterations of typically outright racism, sexism, bigotry, etc. Systemic discrimination are those discriminations that occur in virtue of the system itself, as being described here for instance. Read on. Neither legacy nor systemic discriminations need be related to outright discrimination, though oft enough they were at some point predicated upon them. In other words, no one need be a racist for there to be legacy or systemic discriminations going on that are predicated upon race, and which ultimately unjustly discriminate against some grouping of people. I'm sure if there are racists in the mix, they'll help that unjust discrimination along, but even an anti-racist person can be contributing to the systemic issues, and merely being anti-racist doesn't actually address legacy issues. Changes in the system itself would be required to handle systemic issues, and only something akin to reparations and or affirmative action can handle legacy issues. That said, here we are trying to dig to heart of the issues with meritocracy sans any specific concerns as racism, sexism, bigotry, etc. The argument here, in other words, isn't about the specifics of pragmatic applications, so much as concerns about the systemization as such, even in theory, even assuming that we've already handled all unjust discriminatory aspects from the get-go. The issue gets worse with each iteration of the meritocracy, distorting the metrics of merit predicated upon privileged access via wealth to this and that good and service. It is more troubling though than access to, oh, say, a bit better technology or a bit better food and so forth. It is also the access that wealth grants to gaining control over whole systems of wealth generation. In other words, a very wealthy person doesn't actually have to have any merit in order to gain access to the capacity to produce goods and services. They are enabled to simply buy access to the capacity to produce en masse goods and services. Folks may contend that such is fine, after all, their parents, grandparents, etc. gifted them such things, and so it's fine. I may even tend to agree with the notion to pass something down to the next generation, one's children, etc. 
is a fair amount of the impetus to do anything at all. However, such is not fine within a meritocracy as it undermines the very notion of merit. It's worse though than merely failing the just discrimination notion that being handed masses of wealth by dint of one's birth isn't necessarily just discrimination within a meritocracy. It's far worse because the very metric for how to justly discriminate at all is thereby undermined. Meaning that the system will no longer tend to produce better providers of various goods and services. If, after all, the individuals in charge of such things have no just discriminatory merit involved in their having access to the means of providing goods and services, then they are not likely to be able to produce the better let alone the best goods and services. More damaging still to the meritocracy notion is that if we assume for whatever reason that in point of fact, they are somehow able to nonetheless provide the better or best goods and services, by doing so we would thereby exactly undermine the theoretical foundations of the meritocracy such proponents are seeking to defend. That is, if such people can in fact provide for the better or the best, then the notion that such is determinable by merit is false. After all, they have such capacity by dint of birth alone. To be blunt, these are fundamental flaws within the current meritocracy systemization, specifically flaws causally related to using money as a tool of just discrimination. It will inevitably manifest the absolute worst, the inverse of what it is attempting to aim at. Specifically, it will do so because the abstraction of value in symbolic form of money of any sort lends itself to the unjust accumulation of wealth. There is no solution to this problem of a meritocracy so long as money of any sort is in the system. Note that these issues simply go away within a moneyless free labor society. There are ad hoc solutions to the problem in a moneyed system. The death tax, very high taxing of wealth, limits on the amount of wealth anyone can actually have. Providing government services to compensate for the disadvantaged, plausibly such things as education and programs designed to give folks a leg up, and so forth. Such amounts to the majority of political discourse in the current. But they are all of them ad hoc solutions to the fundamental problem embedded within meritocracy as a concept, especially as it relates to a moneyed systemization. The issue runs deeper than the classic Marxist critique of capitalism, and hence don't really devolve into the communist government takeover problem we pretty much all don't like. Consider after all the issues with preferential treatment and the privileging of the experts. Each of these suffer from similar fatal flaws in their reasoning as it relates to meritocracy, and don't necessarily have anything to do with money. Preferential treatment for whatever reason is practically definitionally opposed to the notion of meritocracy. The issue with it is that it is endemic and in many instances not necessarily a bad thing. Preferential treatment of someone may after all have good reasons behind it. For instance, preferentially treating someone's close to you is generally desirable on a very human level. Preferential treatment of a lover, family, friends, etc. is in some sense defining of the very relationship, and arguably in some sense defining of love's relations in general. Likewise, preferential treatment of, say, Someones who are in all pragmatics disadvantaged may have good practical reasons behind it, and preferential treatment towards talent, skill, etc. actually dovetails well with a notion of meritocracy. Mostly these are however rather pragmatic aspects of life, insofar as they are potentially good, useful, etc. 
The distinction, however, tends to be derived along the same lines as a meritocracy is predicated upon, that is, just discriminatory processes. Insofar as preferential treatment discriminates unjustly, it is not a valid distinction within a meritocracy. Hence folks can witness much of the discourse in the current surrounding seemingly obtuse topics regarding privileges. Is it just to discriminate predicated upon the way someone looks? Is it just to discriminate predicated upon how one feels? Or what one thinks? Or what one says? The temptation is to say yes, of course it is just, it is just to have preferences, it is just to discriminate based on what someone says, and so forth. I want to suggest that although there isn't nothing to that notion, it will tend to produce similar kinds of issues as discriminations predicated upon wealth and more relevantly, the issues produced by discrimination predicated upon who produces the better good or service, specifically, ultimately such discriminatory practices undermine the basis for those discriminatory practices. Moreover, among the big claims being made in this piece, oft rather obliquely so, is that such discriminatory practices are just or not depending upon the scalar one is speaking of. What is just for the individual being unjust for the society, and what is just for the society being unjust for the individual? Likewise, what is just on the particular is unjust upon iteration, and what is just upon iteration is unjust upon the particular. These kinds of distinctions tend to be a bit more subtle and social in how they function, although the Internet has made some of it less subtle, more in the open, and hence easier to witness. It is reasonable, for instance, to hold something akin to the following, I have a preference to date, be sexual with, be friends with, so and so. Or, I have a preference for this or that food, or a preference regarding decisions like to have or not to have children a preference for this or that job, and so on. We may justify such via concepts such as individual choice, or bodily autonomy, or freedom to choose, but here I want to understand it in terms of just or unjust discriminatory practices within a meritocracy. Hence, when I say it is a reasonable, I mean something like, it is just for an individual to determine such things to make their own discriminatory choices regarding their own preferences. Such is hardly a controversial view, and it ultimately underpins much of the discourse in the current. The notion is that the individual is in a privileged position to make those kinds of determinations, and that that privileged position is exactly that they will tend to make better choices for themselves. There may be other rationales given, but again, I want to examine this from the perspective of merit whereby a just discriminatory practice assumes that it is just because it provides for the better outcome. In that sense it ought not be terribly difficult to understand how such will inevitably lead towards bad decisions, understood as decisions that do not have merit on the basis of producing better outcomes. An individual, after all, can only make such discriminatory preferential decisions predicated upon whatsoever they happen to know, are exposed to, taught, etc. Moreover, they will have a tendency to choose predicated upon exactly their previous choices. To use a tame example, consider food choice. An individual firstly merely has experiences that are predicated upon the availability of food within the region, and secondarily predicated upon whatsoever their parents happen to feed them. They do not, in other words, have their tastes predicated upon some innate feature about them as an individual. Their tastes in food are significantly delimited. Beyond that though, 
as I am sure most folks can relate to, once the individual finds something they prefer, they will tend to repeatedly choose that preferential food item. In a sense, this isn't a particularly terrible thing, but by doing so they deny themselves the option to try other foods. When they go to a grocery store, an eatery, etc., they tend to consistently prefer some selective grouping of food items. Hence, they fail repeatedly to find better food options. It may be the case that there are no better food options, but in all pragmatics this is not the case. It isn't even merely failing to choose the better or the best, for there isn't really a singular answer to that question. There are a plethora of good food options, and the variety of tastes so developed is exactly among the goods to be provided for. Hence, not only are they failing to choose options that may actually be better in their own estimation, but they are also failing to choose a plethora whereby the plethora itself is a good. The individual begins to unjustly discriminate in the relevant sense of merit as making the better choices. They become poor decision-makers for themselves. Moreover, what is often underpinning the view of the individual remains someone else's view, specifically the view of their parents or the view of their local region, cultural traditions, and so forth. So it isn't even really the case that the individual is making some deep decision for themselves, rather they are merely projecting the various traditions that preceded them. They don't have to be, but to not be requires some degree of daringness, courage on the part of the taster, to transgress their own bounds of tastes, rather specifically to develop tastes that are heretofore unknown to them. The issue is somewhat worse than this though, as foods that they don't like at one point may end up being foods they would like at another point. For instance, a poorly prepared meal may strike someone as distasteful and hence turn them off from trying the same meal again, or even similar meals. Eating an under-ripened fruit may give the impression that they simply wouldn't enjoy that fruit at all. Worse yet in this staggering pile of worseness, there is a rather horrible tendency of the species to find fault for why it is that they don't like something. In other words, it isn't just that they don't like it, it is that there are reasons why they don't like it, and hence there is something wrong with it. While this tendency isn't without just cause, a piece of rotten food does indeed have plausible reasons as to why not to like it. The problem is that simply no preferring something is assumed therefore to have some kind of reason behind it, as if tastes were in need of justification. Such may not really be that big a deal in regards to food selection, Though I will point out that there are some pragmatics involved in eating well that make it something of a significant issue. Food selection, growing, etc., are all massive parts of the economic structure, as ought be clear to anyone who has bothered to read this or pay attention to reality at all. Consider less tame examples, like selection of friends. Again, the individual is of course firstly limited in their selection predicated upon their region, circumstances, etc., and have their preferences significantly shaped by their childhood experiences whereby their parents tend to play a significant role in determining who is acceptable and who isn't acceptable to be friendly with. Hence, by the time they are making their own decisions, in some non-trivial sense, they are primarily projecting their upbringing in the choice of friends more than anything else. As with foods, they may tend to develop some friendliness with certain kinds of people, specifically the kinds of people that make them feel good, whom they enjoy being around, or have some bad experiences with some folks such that they avoid them. In either case, the individual may thereby tend towards some and away from others. 
It may, however, be the case that the people they are tending towards aren't even the better choice regarding who they would actually prefer to be friends with. As with foods there is good to be had in the variety, there is good to be had in the trying out, and there are rather serious concerns regarding the justifying of preference via the making of the bad, out of a simple preference to not. To hold, in other words, that there is definitely something wrong with that person. Oft enough predicate upon broad categories such as race, class, gender, sexuality, etc. That is the justifying cause whereby one simply doesn't enjoy being friends with them. We can say similar things of selection of lovers and indeed with selection of sexual preferences. More troubling still, we can find the same issue regarding ethical concerns, choices in behavior, and determinations of ethical relevance. In each of these cases, the individual is, again, primarily delimited in their selective capacities predicated upon their upbringing, parents, etc., and hence primarily doesn't actually make their own decisions so much as project the decisions of their forebearers and likewise as they tend to repeatedly make the same choices, they become bad decision-makers in the process. Selecting repeatedly for the same kinds of things they have generally always known, hence undermining the merit of the decisions. Unless and until they are daring enough, have the courage enough, the passion enough to do the wise. For these kinds of things, again, the situation is far worse than simply making bad decisions for themselves. After all, it isn't the case that the individual is making their decisions alone. They've tended towards selection of friends, lovers, and trusted people along the same grounds. Moreover, those people have tended to do the exact same thing. Hence what they think is largely simply a reflection of a series of bad choices. The situation is worse still, for even the predicated metric, the individual, has very peculiar interests. Namely, rather short-term interests. There is a tendency in other words to consider the most immediate, rather than anything that may be of longer-term worth, even to themselves. The imperative to feel better can be extremely misleading, especially in the contexts whereby the individual has been repeatedly self-selecting towards merely those things that make the most immediate sense. It is worth seriously considering this as it relates to evolutionary theory, which tends to functionally operate in theory predicated upon exactly this kind of principle. While it may be unclear as to the merits of this in regards to, say, biological evolution as such, insofar as the theory is concerned such presents a rather fundamental problem, such will tend to produce the worst possible results, not survival of the fittest, but survival of the least fit, which of course doesn't really make much sense as a theory of evolution. However, such is beyond the scope of this piece. How can I put this delicately? There is a kind of lack of imagination that underpins evolutionary theory. It predicates itself upon short-term thinking, short-term gains, the most immediate of concerns, as if that were all that life was actually capable of. The longer-term thinking provides for a different sort of approach to understanding life, indeed, towards even grasping at how life may functionally operate. The former is almost reactionary, reactive, almost unthinking, barely sentient, mostly projecting, holding on by little more than hope, and desperately needing a helping hand. The latter is calm, holds to longer-term dispositions, thinks out a situation, acts with cautious daring, and is glad to provide a helping hand. In what may be the most pragmatic of instances, not unrelated to the bit on evolution, 
The decision to have or not to have children is a rather striking example of this sort of thinking. Insofar as we are concerned with these bodies, this life, this species, our progeny are fundamentally our means of propagation. We could delve into the spiritual modalities of propagation and other modalities of propagation, but here let's just limit the discussion to the propagation of this species, the propagation of the individual, and the propagation of these kinds of bodies. As all the examples display, an individual's children are primarily something like continuations of the individual, primarily, though not exclusively, an individual tends to project their forebearers in their decisions. Not alone, and not completely, but in many senses an individual's children are continuations of the individual. The individual who decides not to have children is in that sense choosing not to continue their own life. How they come to make that determination is exactly as individuals as in individualistic concerns. They may couch it in other ways, but what that decision amounts to is a decision by an individual to not continue to exist predicated exactly upon their individualistic concerns. Ethical decision-making at its finest. Now, we may perhaps denote that such decisions can have other factors involved. Folks may even debate the merits of continuing the species. It may be the case that the right to suicide is a valid thing. However, strictly speaking in terms of merits, meritocracy, the assumption that meritocracy tends to produce better results, and the assumption that an individual is best suited to make decisions for themselves, provided that we hold that suicide is not generally the better option for the individual to make, we can hold again that such is an example of the failures of meritocracy and individualism to make the better choices, even for themselves. To reaffirm the point, what is in question here is the nature of a meritocracy in general, and how it relates to a society that tends to privilege merit and individual choices. While the primary concern of this piece is specifically the utilization of money as a metric, and how society can function sans money, in the current capitalism is so embedded with the concept of meritocracy that the discussion can't really be had without also discussing the issues with meritocracy more generally. It is one thing to remove the tool of money from the meritocracy and examine the principles of trade, economics, labor, and so forth. It is another thing to get at the notion of meritocracy in general. Money, after all, in the current and ideally, is intended to be used as a tool to determine and incentivize merit, to create abundance through the means of, in essence, coercion. Among the issues being brought forth here is how money as a reward mechanism, perhaps more generally how symbolic rewarding mechanisms have cumulative effects that are negative to decision-making, even on an individual level, let alone on a societal level. The differentiations between these scalars, the societal and the individual, is very relevant to the most pertinent questions at hand in society in the current. There are temporal dimensions to it, immediate versus non-immediate, iterative dimensions, which may be the same as temporal dimensions, namely what is good for an action versus what is good upon iteration, and differences in scalar effective form, what is good for the individual may be bad for the society. To quote the poets, truth is not measured via mass appeal, nor however is it measured particularly well by individualistic concerns. Perhaps least well of all is truth measured via moneyed concerns. Though we might come well to understand such as a means of measure in the negative, at least, that is, moneyed concerns may have provided folks with the means of knowing what not to do. 
all the horrible of mass appeal and individualistic hubris, tied up in a neat ball of cash ready to be burned along with all human ills thereof. Money is no object, all can be bought for the low, low price of no more money. あなた GAIU こと。